Good evening. If you'll turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Ruth in chapter 4. Book of Ruth, chapter 4, we'll be going through the verses 13 through 15. So as you get there, if we can all rise for the reading of God's word. And as you are turning there and as you are standing to remember that the Bible is a gift of God to his church for the comfort and establishment of that church and for the preservation and propagation of truth. Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And and he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourish and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is more than seven sons, has given birth to him. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we look to the conclusion of this wonderful story, Lord, as we begin to examine the end of this, of this story. Let our hearts be raised in affection for you. Let us see your character and your works. Let us see the glory of yourself in the light of your, in the face of your son, Jesus Christ. Allow our hearts to ruminate and to meditate on these things. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, you may be seated. The book of Ruth has two major themes, and the first major theme is that of providence, Uh, specifically providence, the providence of redemption, which is the second major theme of the book of Ruth. And as we come to the conclusion of our story, we're coming to the climax, to the high point of the work of providence and redemption. It is It is the end of providence. It is the point of redemption here. That redemption is uh, found in its fullest. So where we're at so far in this story is that Boaz, uh, in the verses preceding this, has just purchased Ruth's redemption. And then now, Boaz now completing uh, the act of redemption by bringing Ruth into his house. And by this marriage, we also see the bringing of, of life uh, to the line of death. Now that there is no longer the house of mourning, the house of death, Ruth is brought into a house of life, which is depicted in the fact that in the marriage, uh, Ruth conceives and bears a son. So Ruth and Boaz's marriage is, uh, therefore then illustrates the glory of redemption. And, and that's what we need to think about today. That's, that's what I want to stress to you, is that this is actually a glorious passage, not merely because we're seeing a happy ending. We're seeing an actual classical comedy. If you know, a Shakespearean comedy ends with a wedding, whereas a Shakespearean tragedy ends with the death of the major characters. And so, we're, and so we've had the wedding. It is a comedic end to the story. But marriage, uh, Ruth and Boaz's marriage, illustrates the glory of redemption because that's what marriage does. All marriages within the scriptures illustrate the glory of God and redemption. Marriage is a, is a wonderful institution that was created by God to teach us about some of the glories of God and of his work. Marriage was instituted by God to teach us the glories of God, his character, and the glories of God's work. Now, it is important to note, as tonight's sermon is marriage as redemption, I do know that I've already talked about marriage as conversion. It was in the beginning, uh, back in chapter 1. It seems like a long time ago, but it really wasn't. And it's important to know that, that that sermon 
is not a contradiction in any way or somehow lessens what I'm trying to say, or does this sermon lessen what I said back then? Good illustrations bring a large amount of light to many different topics. In fact, it was, uh, I, I believe Charles Spurgeon was the one who started it, but, but he says illustrations are like windows in a house. Uh, they, 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 they let in light so we can see what is in there. And marriage just happens to be a large, well-placed window that illuminates many rooms in this house. So that's why we're coming back to this idea of looking at marriage again and thinking of it from a different perspective, looking literally the light of the illustration of marriage in a different room of the house. And so good illustrations make teaching and, and, and pondering and meditating on things far easier. So that's why we're here again. We're going to talk about marriage and redemption some more, which is always a good theme anyways. So our big idea for tonight is this. Boaz and Ruth's marriage is a wonderful illustration of Christ's redemptive marriage to his church. Ruth and Boaz's marriage is a wonderful illustration of Christ's redemptive marriage to his church. Church. So what I want to do is I want to break down marriage as an illustration of redemption, and then I want to talk about specifically Ruth and Boaz, and then specifically Christ and the church. So our first heading, marriage illustrates redemption. So our question is easy to start. How does marriage illustrate redemption? And it's by showing us a purchase or a, or a giving of a dowry, a betrothal, and then there is the consummation or the bringing in to a new home. Those, those three parts show us the different acts of redemption as they happen. And so it's important to note that, that God himself actually goes through all of these processes with the, with the children of Israel uh, in the Old Testament. As he redeems them, he actually uses the language of marriage. So the first, God gives a dowry for his people. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 3 and 4, he says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba, in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in exchange for your life. So God is giving something. So, so here's how dowries would work back in the day, is that a prospective man would go to a, to a girl's father and say, I want your daughter's hand in marriage. And the father would say, prove it. And so then the man, the young man, would have to give the father some kind of price to prove that he was a worthy uh, suitor for his daughter. It could be money, it could be animals, it, it could be whatever it is. Um, but there was a price that was given. Um, so this is what God does. We think about the Exodus. God gave in exchange for his love. He gave Egypt, destroyed them paid uh, for Israel by the blood of Egypt. So God then was giving a dowry. He gave something in exchange for his people. But also God betrothes his people. Uh, Hosea uh, chapter 2, verses 16 and verse 19. Uh, verse 16 says, And in that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. And then in verse 19 it says, And I will betroth you uh, to me forever. So think about what's happening in that particular song. I'm skipping some of the paragraph, but it all says the same thing. You will no longer just call me a mere God or one of the gods. You will call me my husband because you are betrothed to me. The people of God will call God husband because God has betrothed them. That is an act of marriage. That's the first part of marriage. So after the dowry is given, once it's accepted, there's now a covenant that is made 
between a man and a woman. And that is called betrothal. Now, they have not consummated that marriage yet, but back in the, back in the ancient times, betrothal was just as surefire of a, of a covenant as marriage. It required a divorce to end a betrothal. Today, we, some people try to say, well, we get engaged now. But in engagement, people can just call it off, take the ring off, t- take, the, take the engagement ring off, and you're done. You don't have to go get lawyers. You don't have to go before a judge. You don't have to go before a court. But back in those days, you did. In fact, think about the the Advent story, right? When Joseph finds Mary with child, what does he do? He wants to put her away, divorce her, but do it without bringing her much shame because he loved her. Now, we know how that story goes. He ended up not doing that, but that is why he had to put her away. He couldn't just say, oh, we're calling it off. No, there was a covenant and a contract made. There was a dowry that had been paid. And Mary was his for all intents and purposes. He was betrothed, and so God does the same thing. He then betrothes his people to himself to a point that he says that you are now, you shall call me my husband because you are betrothed to me forever. And God then, going along the the illustration of marriage then, God then brings his people, his betrothed, to a new home that he prepares for them. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 13, it says, I give you a land on which you have not labored in cities that you have not built, and you dwell in them. The promised land was a land prepared by God so his people could enter rest. It was a home prepared by God so that his people, his betrothed, his special possession could live there and and live with him forever. And it's interesting to know that 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 God's uh, redemption of Israel is also an image of marriage, not just because of these things, but also because God himself calls the exile into Assyria and to Babylon a form of divorce. God divorces. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, speaking of, of, of the land of Judah, you know, Judah saw uh, for all the adulteries of that faithless one Israel, the northern kingdom, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Israel was sent into Assyria because God gave them a decree of divorce because they had broken the covenant. And so think about that. If that's how God views sending his people into exile out of the land, which was their home, putting them away out of the home, then yeah, Marriage is a picture of redemption. It's how God covenantally works with his people. And so one of the reasons I want to do this is because biblically speaking, uh, speaking of redemption as a form of marriage is right and good. It is what God does himself. And, and we should meditate when we think about the wonders of God, the character of God, the work of God. Uh, we should take the time to think about how Marriage is a picture of that, and it's a wonderful picture of that, a very wonderful picture of that. But so with that laid as the foundation, let's think about now the, the, the picture given to us in Boaz and Ruth, our second heading, the marriage of Boaz and Ruth. So what about the marriage of Boaz and Ruth illustrate redemption? Now, we know it's a particular picture. It doesn't give us everything, but it gives us something. So what is, what are those things? Well, first we know Boaz purchased Ruth for redemption. By by claiming to say, I purchased the land from Naomi and, and, and I therefore also purchased Ruth, Boaz gave a dowry in front of all the elders of Bethlehem for Ruth. He purchased Ruth, uh, very much like paying a dowry. And at this point, they were functionally betrothed. At this point, once once that's been cut, is that I have bought Ruth to be my wife, 
She's his wife. They are officially betrothed. And because of that, then, um, Boaz then, as a betrothed, then brings Ruth into his home. A place that Boaz had prepared a place for Ruth to live as his wife. And so Ruth brings her from the house of death, which was with Naomi, uh, from a dead family, into a house of life, as we know, as they conceive and, and have a child. And what's interesting about, as far as where this is at our story, is not only does Boaz bring Ruth into his home, but as far as we see, as far as Ruth is, this is her final resting place. This is her final home. This is her forever home. We can say here that they lived happily ever after. And so this is what's happening. Uh, These things, marriage, this marriage process has been played out before our eyes in our story of Boaz and Ruth. And it's interesting that the consummation following uh, uh, the consummation and, and the following conception also pictures eternity, the eternal rest, the eternal home as well. At this point, the full purpose of redemption, once Ruth has that child, the full purpose of redemption is, is now has now taken place. This is the end of redemption, the purpose of redemption. Redemption is about the creation of life, the giving of life, much like the main function of marriage is. One of the main functions of marriage is is making life. It is procreation. But we also know that marriage is far more than that too, which is why it's not merely just life, but it's life abundantly. It's life fully. It's life to the fullest, to the greatest, to the perfection. Because marriage is more than procreation, although it's not less. Intimacy is a part of marriage, but intimacy is more than physical. Think about this. Consummation and and conception are pictures of eternity, because being one flesh is not about the flesh, it's about the heart. Being one flesh is not about the flesh, it's about the heart. True intimacy is about being united in heart. And the true intimacy is the healing and life-giving balm in our story. See, Ruth and Boaz are experiencing life, abundant life. And by that, they're redeeming and restoring even Naomi in her old age, out of her bitterness, out out of her despair. She's also, there is so much life being produced. It's not just the child that's produced, but also Naomi is reinvigorated with life. And we know because she becomes the child's nurse afterwards, which would have been a hard job for a lady who was older. But she's reinvigorated now. Redemption has brought abundant life to everybody that has been involved And that's really an important thing. Marriage is not merely about creating life as in more people. It's about creating life as in wonderful life, abundant life, good life. Ruth was purchased and redeemed by Boaz, not merely just be a woman in the house that makes children, but to be her, but she was to be his treasured possession. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, that's what God calls his people. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 8 say, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping an oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He wanted to 
he brought them out to be a treasure possession because he loves them. Just like Boaz purchased Ruth because he loves her. See, marriage is far more than just a marriage bed. It's a marriage house, which has a kitchen, a living room, has everything in it. It's, it, is, it is life united heart to heart with someone else. That's why it's one of the most wonderful things that God could have given us. It's also why it's one of the most hurtful things you could possibly have happen to you. Having your heart ripped out of your chest can be devastating. But that's what marriage is. Marriage is is a life-giving thing, an abundant life-giving institution. And that's what Ruth and Boaz were having. And it points directly, if you're not already ahead of me, it points directly to what Christ and his marriage to the church are supposed to do. So what about the marriage of Christ and the church? So how does this all point to Christ? First, according to Paul in Ephesians, all marriage points to Christ and the church. That's what Paul says in Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verse 32. He says, the mis- this mystery is profound, and I am saying it refers to Christ and the church. He's talking about women, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives, wash them with the word, uh, love them like Christ loves his church, because at the end of the day, this mystery, this wonderful thing, is about Christ and his church. That's what marriage is about. That's why God instituted it in the first place, to teach us something about himself and about his work. And even to go from there, the words of Christ himself, if we're going to go outside of Paul or outside the apostles, the words of Christ himself point to this, uh, to this fact. In fact, in Matthew chapter 9, uh, verse 15, Jesus is, is, uh, is answering questions from, from the Pharisees. Why don't your apostles uh, fast like, like, all, like all of us do? And Jesus said to them, as it says in, 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 in a Matthew chapter 9, verse 15, it says, And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. The Pharisees are like, Why are your disciples having so much fun around you? Because the bridegroom is here. We're celebrating. I'm coming to purchase my bride. Why would we be gloomy about that? That's also recorded for us in Mark chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, and Luke chapter 5, verses 34 through 35. That same story is given. But then, uh, in later on, in... Uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13, that's the parable of the virgins. What's happening there? What is Christ depicting there? There are 10 virgins, and they all have lamps. They're all waiting, and they, and they all fall asleep until who shows up? The bridegroom. Who's the bridegroom in that parable? It's Jesus. But it's not Jesus paying a dowry, for he will have already done that on the cross. It's Jesus coming back to bring his bride to their new home. And that's a cause for celebration as well. But think about also in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, where Jesus says, But concerning the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Number one thing to understand about that particular phrase is that's a phrase referring to marriage and the consummation of marriage because the husband, the, the betrothed husband is preparing a place for his wife and, 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 and his father gives him the sign, okay, now go get your wife. You've prepared enough. Go get her. That's what Jesus is referring to. He's not saying, oh, it's just such this great mystery that not even I know. No, he's trying to say no. The whole point is that there's a preparation that has to be done. And just like here on earth where where, where that preparation happens and finally the Father says, go get your bride, that's going to happen in heaven too. 
And that's actually what's, what, what he tells us uh, in, John, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are, are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Brothers and sisters, how is that not betrothal in consummation language? Jesus paid the price with his blood, and now he's preparing the place, and he will come for his bride. Those are Jesus' own words. Not mine. And so let's think about this. How has Jesus done these things and how can we benefit from meditating on these things? So by his blood, he paid the price of redemption and then he gives us a token of that betrothal. Um, Ephesians chapter 1 talks about this. Where he pays the price and then he gives us a sign. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, the first ver- uh, is uh, verses 7, and then skipping ahead to verses 13 and 14. So Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Then verse 8, in which he lavished on us in wisdom and insight. He lavished riches because he's, he's, he has these riches. But then what it says Uh, Farther down in verses uh, 13 and 14, he says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Redemption's been purchased. And every time someone comes to faith, they hear the gospel, and they come to faith, Christ gives them a token of that betrothal, the Holy Spirit. Gives them a token that they can have indwelling in them so that they can know that they belong to Christ. Christ... um, well, one day then, it's looking ahead to what Christ will do and how he points it, Christ will one day end the betrothal and bring us into a new home to dwell with him. And that's what John 14, uh, verses 1 through 3 speak of. But another place where this is mentioned is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and then verse 5. For we know that if the tent... Is our earth, that is, our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Then verse 5, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who, has, who gives us the Spirit as a guarantee. There's another reference to this. God is building a home for his bride, for his treasured possession, for his chosen people, for his precious ones. And he gives us the spirit to remind us that we belong to him. Now, at the end of the day, what the, what the gospel story ends with is that Christ will bring his people to live with him in true Intimacy. And it's why it's so important to understand that intimacy is not merely physical. Because the the marriage of Christ and his church is not a physical one, but it's an intimate one. They're united in heart. And I just want to read from the book of Revelation. I'm going to read, just so you can jot down your notes, I'm going to read chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. And then I'm going to read uh, chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. And then we read chapter 22, verses 3 through 5. And I, and I want you, as I read these things, as we hear about the new heavens and the new earth, as we hear about the new Jerusalem, the heavenly home, I want you to try to meditate on the words of true intimacy that are found within these sections. So the first, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. 
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I just wanted to take a second before reading the next section and think about even in our story of Ruth and Boaz. There had been bitterness and despair and tears and death. And now in Boaz's house, those things don't exist anymore. It's a house of life. Next, in chapter 21, verses 22 and 23, it says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. On earth, in this world, temples separated God and man. But the new heavens and the new earth, they dwell together face to face. In our last chapter 22, verses 3 through 5, it says this, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever, face to face, heart to heart. No more need of sun, because God himself has brought us to our new home. Brothers and sisters, if we believe and I put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are betrothed to Christ. We are his. And he will bring us home one day. And this is the hope that we live by day to day. This world is not our home. We're betrothed to Christ. He's preparing a place for us. And one day, he will bring us to that wonderful place where we live in the truest intimacy, the truest glory, the greatest and most abundant life that could ever be thought possible. That's how this story, how our story in Ruth points to the glory of Christ, his character, and his work. And all I can do is exhort you to continue to think about this. Continue to think dear Christian, about your betrothal to Christ and how he will never fail you and he will bring you home. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have chosen us to be your prized possession, your special treasure. You have paid the ultimate price for your bride. Heavenly Father, let us wait eagerly in anticipation for the glorious day when you are done preparing our place and you send your Son, our our Heavenly Husband, to take us home. Until then, Lord, let us live this life to the fullest. Let us live this life in the hope of glory. Give us life abundantly and joy that is full because we belong to you and your Son and that is sealed by your spirit. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.